Hello, bienvenidos. My name is Rosie Chinea Shaver, and I'm the Executive Director of the Catholic Association for Latino Leadership. Thank you for joining us this Advent season to journey with Call and Mary on a three-part series on Marian Hispanic apparitions. This is the last in this three-part series. Tonight, we will have the renowned professor and president of the USC Institute of Advanced Catholic Studies, Father Dorian Llewellyn, who will wrap up this series and speak about the Latin American Marian apparitions and miraculous images in global and historical context. As we begin all good things, I'm going to lead us in an opening prayer. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God of love, your son Jesus is your greatest gift to us. He is a sign of your love. Help us walk in that love during this last week of Advent. As we wait and prepare for his coming, we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now I'd like to introduce our guest, Father Dorian Llewellyn. Father Dorian Llewellyn is a Welshman, Western USA province of the Society of Jesus. Father Dorian received his PhD in theology from the University of Wales, a licentiate in sacred theology from the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, a bachelor in sacred theology from the Universidad Pontifica de Salamanca, Spain, and a bachelor and master of art in English from the University of Cambridge, England. Currently, he is the president of the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies at USC. From 2016 to 2020, Father Dorian served as the executive director of the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education at Santa Clara University, and from 2003 to 2015 was a professor of theology at Loyola Marymount University right here in LA. Father Dorian has also taught at the University of London, Seattle University, Marquette University, and the University of Wales, and is, was a research, a senior research fellow at Stanford University's Institute for Humanities. Father Dorian has authored two academic books and many scholarly articles. His area of expertise include Mariology, Faith, and Culture, and Eastern Christian icon Iconography. He has lived in eight countries in Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Americas, including six years during the UK equivalent of Peace Corps in Indonesia and Egypt. He speaks several languages, including French, Spanish, and Welsh. He is a regular columnist for Angelus and The Conversation, and has been a source for stories in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, among many other public publications. He also continues to contribute to BBC Radio in Wales. In Los Angeles, he celebrates mass at St. Martin de Torres in Brentwood and American Martyrs in Manhattan Beach. He's a member of the Theological Commission of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and a provisional chaplain for the Order of Malta. Without further ado, I will hand it over to Father Dorian Llewellyn. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, hopefully I'm turning up on screen right now. Um, is that correct, Edgar? You are, you're good. Okay, excellent, good. Um, so thank you, Rosie, for that. Um, I think you called me uh, renowned, that was something like that. It was, I don't think I've been called that before, but thank you for that. <laughs> Um, so tonight I want to talk about Marian apparitions and, and miraculous images in global and historical context. And why I think this is important is that we understand our own devotions, that they are part of a kind of a larger, a larger reality. Um, it's said that the vast Marian world includes scripture, it involves dogma and doctrine, uh, but it also involves, involves devotion and culture. Now, I think in the global north, um, after the Second Vatican Council, in many parts of that devotion to our Blessed Mother somewhat declined, uh, but it has remained strong and an essential part of people's Christian faith in other parts of the world, uh, especially in Latin America and now in the countries where people of Latino uh, descent live. So shrines at sites where uh, Mary has appeared or which shrines which house miraculous stat statues draw millions of devotees every year. So uh, this evening, what I want to do is to talk about some general remarks about apparitions. And then I'm going to, uh, in, after I'm done with those, I'd like to play you a video that I made a few years ago on Marian apparitions. And I'll conclude with some, uh, some thoughts about the theology of apparitions. 
So the first thing I want to say is that we're talking about something which is a very, very long history. Um, there is a legend uh, that Mary appeared to the Apostle James the Great in Zaragoza in Spain in the year 40. Uh, she was surrounded by thousands of angels and she was holding the child Jesus in her, in her arms. But the first time that we have actually something in print, as it were, um, is an account of Mary's miraculous appearance to, in a dream to St. Gregory the Wonder Worker in the mid third century. And that comes uh, in an account about a th uh, about 100 years later, a sermon by St. Gregory of Nyssa. So what we can say is that Marian apparitions have been a regular part of the church's life since the fourth century. And not only the Catholic Church, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, for example, celebrates a feast called the Protection of the Mother of God. It commemorates an appearance in the 10th century of Mary to someone called St. Andrew, the Blessed Fool for Christ, in Constantinople. And there, she, in the vision, um, the apparition promised delivery from the enemy troops who were besieging the city. Now, in the European Middle Ages, Mary was part and, par part and parcel of the fabric of daily life, a central part of people's Catholic and Christian faith. All over Europe, there were uh, Europe is dotted with shrines, and many of these were Marian shrines were actually connected with with apparitions. There were many legends which chronicled her direct intervention in saving people from disaster, following prayer, for example, to a particular image. I mean, there are accounts which include uh, of her stepping into the daily um, into people's daily lives. One of the one of the things that quite often we get in the account, and there come some standard usual forms, is that Mary appears to someone and she commands that a chapel or a shrine should be constructed there at the site of her appearance. So that's a European medieval model, uh, which I think we can recognize or now uh, in the story of uh, uh, the Blessed Mother's apparition to San Juan Diego there. Now, um, some of those shrines were not, strictly speaking, um, apparitions, but they housed miraculous statues. What makes them miraculous? Well, sometimes they were discovered of um, ancient statues that had perhaps had been hidden and then which revealed themselves in a tree or bricked up behind a wall. And one common thing that happens in there is that um, those statues want to be in one particular place. They refuse to move. Or if Mary reveals in a dream where her statue is to is to be located and where she wishes to be venerated, uh, Rosie and I were talking really about this the devotion to of um, to in Argentina to Nuestra Señora de Luján, which is an 18th century story. But in that case, it wasn't that the statue refused to move; it's the oxen which were transporting it to another place. Refused, they lay down; they wouldn't move. So there was a feeling that okay, this is the place. It's as if the Blessed Mother has chosen a site. And so this, I guess, the basic message of these immovable statues and indeed of apparitions is this place is holy. This is where, where Mary wishes to be venerated. It's as if she has chosen it as her home. Now, if we're talking about the context of Latin America, then we certainly have to say that, that Marian devotion was an essential part of, in the evangelization of the, the territories of the Catholic crowns of Europe. In Columbus's voyages of discovery, Mary's name, the Virgin's name, turns up a number of times. The conquerors of Central and South America were devotees of the Virgin. And there are accounts of the conquest, which includes the Virgin appearing battle against the native armies who were resisting the Christian invaders. So she is la conquistadora. But today, uh, in the countries of Latin America, as you know better than I do, the figure of Mary is not conquistadora, but she's that of mother and protector. And she's often the protector of the nation as well. So in Argentina and Chile, she is a general in both those armies. She has that rank. In Chile as Mr. Señora del Carmen and uh, in Nuestra Señora de Luján in Argentina. Now, Without throughout the countries of each country in Latin America has at least one national Mary, as it were. That is not only there are also regional devotions as well. Okay? And many of these are associated with apparitions or miraculous images. 
images. So I'm going to say that Cuba and then uh, and um, and Mexico have we have to understand them in a in a large context. There's one claim that is often um, read, which is this, that, that where the Catholic Church is strong, Mary is given prominence and vice versa. But also where she is downplayed, the Catholic Church is not strong. But there's a third part of that, which is where the Catholic Church is struggling, Mary appears and helps. Good example of this would be France following the French Revolution for over a hundred years, there was a culture war between church and state. Both church and state struggled for the battle of the soul of the French nation to define what it meant to be French. And there were many apparitions in 19th century France, the most famous of them being Lourdes. And I wanna say that those apparitions were the most effective element in the struggle for the church against French secular control. Here in this, in the uh, near, to, near to home, the idea of image and apparition come together in the most famous Marian devotion of, of the Americas, Our Lady of Guadalupe. The Basilica of Guadalupe, which is built on the site of the apparition, obviously, is the most visited Catholic site in the shrine in the world. And the devotion to Our Lady is spread internationally. But there are other important shrines and pilgrimage centers which are connected with Marian apparitions. At the Rue du Bac in Paris, uh, in Paris, in 1830, the Virgin appeared to Saint Catherine Labouré, a daughter of charity. And it, that appearance in 1830 marks the beginning, what is sometimes called the Siècle de Marie, the, the Marian age or the Marian century. Now, the message to St. Catherine included warning of political troubles to come, but it also engendered a new Marian devotion, which is the miraculous medal. So the design was shown in a vision to St. Catherine, and it has been worn by millions of devotees. But of the 19th century apparitions, I think it is Lourdes which has grasped the religious imagination most firmly throughout the world. The 18 appearances there of a, a lady to the young peasant girl, Bernadette Soubirou, the spring, which emerged, the miraculous healings, and then the eventual revelation of the name of the lady as the Immaculate Conception, all seem to be the heavenly confirmation of the formal doc declaration of the Immaculate Conception as dogma four years earlier before the apparition started. Now, if I was to ask somebody to paint in their mind, at least, an image of the Blessed, uh, of the, the, the blessed Mother, I wonder what would turn up. My guess is that whatever image we have, it is somewhat similar to the Lourdes apparitions. Mary is dressed in a white robe with a blue sash. She has a golden rose on each foot. She's carrying a rosary of pearls. That's the image which abides in the popular Catholic imagination. And today, like the Basilica of Guadalupe, Lourdes, Lourdes attracts millions every year. People who come to wash in the waters in the hope of a miracle. Lourdes was aided and abetted by the fact that at that point, uh, there were national newspapers and there was train travel. And today, in our modern era, travel and communications have made apparitions of the Blessed Mother more than just local events. They are truly international events. So we look at this in this global context. Now, uh, if we hopefully, we're gonna pray to the uh, patron saint of technology, um, Saint Isidore Seville, and we hope that our video will work. I'd like to show you a video on apparitions, which I made about 12 years ago, and it will expand on what, some of what I've said already. And then finally, after that, I'd like to talk about and make some final remarks on the theology uh, of apparitions. So thank you for that. And let me see if I can do this. And there we go. And we will play. <laughs> Two thousand cases of appearance of nineteen century world buying from a search of a lady. Curious secrets that Jesus and prayer and the devoir and the peace of the extraordinary ashes of the Sahara Bell's apocalypse theology.
Aryan apparitions. Without doubt, Mary is the most common figure who appears in these apparitions, sometimes in dreams, but quite often in particular places at different particular times. But the form of the apparition, precisely what goes on, what people experience, where, when, has changed through the centuries. Since 1930, one specialist in the field thinks there have been about 2,000 cases of people claiming that Mary has appeared to them. The first recorded event that we have of Mary appearing to somebody, the first one that we know about, is in a dream which somebody had about the year 230. So we're talking here about something which has gone over on for a period of almost 2,000 years. Now, why that happens, I don't know. But what you can say is that I would say probably hundreds of thousands of people have experienced Mary's presence and sometimes Mary's messages to them in some way or another. When Mary appears to people, sometimes people don't actually see many, many, many details. Sometimes it's almost like just a, a lady of light or a ball of light in some cases. Sometimes it's actually very, very, very precise. Uh, Catherine Labouré, when Mary appeared to her, actually heard Mary's silk dress rustling. So it was a very kind of very specific thing in some ways. But when Mary speaks, which is not always, it's always in the local language. In the Middle Ages, I'd say there's almost a standard form of Mar Mary's apparitions. And it's quite often not exactly her, but it's something connected with her quite often to do with a statue or maybe a particular church. And the average person who gets an apparition, who, who claims that they see Mary in the Middle Ages, is somebody who is a royal person or a, an aristocrat or quite frequently a monk or a nun. That changed, it began to change in about the 16th century and it's certainly the 19th century, which some people call the century of Mary. Things changed rapidly there during that period. Now, clearly, there's a kind of a connection between psychology and spirituality. This area is an area where it's very difficult to talk with a great deal of certainty about this is definitely happening, this is definitely not happening. How much of this is imagination? How much of this is God speaking? How much of this is psychology? It's quite difficult for those to, think, to, to work out. So the church, the Roman Catholic Church, has been very, very wary about making any official statement about whether these things are true or not and in a way who can tell what's going on in each individual human soul and each individual mind you just don't have access to the secret so even to define what an apparition is is really quite difficult if i see mary does it mean that everybody else sees her clearly not we have many documented cases where people, the visionaries or the seers are experiencing some kind of trance or some vision of Mary and nobody else knows what's going on. But because it's possible for people to get very, I want to say seduced by this in some ways. I mean, it's if you have a, if you think of yourself as having a, a vision of Mary, you experience that or of anybody for us, it could be easy to think of yourself as being a very special person. So it could be kind of a big ego trip in some way. So the church is always very, very, very careful. But there have been cases when the church has said, no, you know what? This is not supernatural. This is just people's psychology working. It's God is not present. One of the ways in which the church has been able to decide this is actually the content of a message. And particularly in the 19th century, many, many Marian apparitions, apparitions of Mary, suddenly started talking about the end of the world, what would happen. And some of them talked about kind of a divine punishment for people's wickedness. In the early 1980s, a group of young people in a small place called Medjugorje in Croatia began experiencing receiving visions of the Virgin Mary. Now, nobody else could see these things. They were a group of people in their late teens, early 20s, who just looked at a wall where apparently Mary was appearing, and they'd fix on that and go into trance, and Mary was speaking to them. But it's a good example of how complex and how difficult it is to try and understand what's going on here. Not surprisingly, Mary gave messages. 
And she revealed herself as being queen of peace. And what she asked for typically, apparently in the messages, which they relayed to the, to the people who went there, was quite often the typical Marian messages, which are repentance, more prayer, some consoling messages, and then some messages which perhaps are a little too, a little more threatening. So then we have what those young people themselves experience. Now that's one thing, but there's a whole other side of the coin is that more than 2 million people have gone to that place. Many of those people who have gone there have experienced extraordinary events. They talk about their rosaries turning gold in their hands, and they talk about looking at the sun and the sun dancing or spinning. And you can be, there are, there are accounts of this where people are claiming that they've seen it, and somebody, one person will see it and another person will not. Now, part of that, I think what's going on is that some people are more psychologically conditioned in what them. That's if you go there expecting to see a miracle, you're more likely to, to see one. Now, the Royal Catholic Church has got a process for investigating things like this. And the first person who investigates is the local bishop. And, and if the local bishop says, this is not supernatural, the whole thing stops there and people are, let's say, from a discouraged from going there. That's exactly what happened. However, the visitors kept on coming. And what happened there in that case was the Vatican opened up the, the investigation again. I think partly because there was so much pressure. Where the status quo is with this situation now is that it seems to have kind of calmed down in some ways. It's certainly the war in, in Croatia knocked it on the head tremendously. But there is a history in Marian apparitions that there are very, very few places of Marian apparitions which where there's a long tradition of people going there. Initially, what happens is we have the event itself, and the place where that happens be turns into a kind of a shrine or a place where people go on pilgrimages, where there were hundreds of thousands of people went to these, to these places of apparitions where Mary had talked to young shepherds and uh, young children. Only one of those remains as a popular place, which is Lourdes. What do you have in Lourdes is the experience of somebody, a young Bernadette Subiru, who saw the Virgin Mary perhaps 18, 19 times, and actually suffered for it in many ways. The number of things typically that people do there in Lourdes, and these are in response to the things that Mary said to Bernadette herself. A spring sprung up there in, in Lourdes, and it now pr produces hundreds of thousands of gallons of water per year. What people do with that is that there are public taps, and they'll go and drink that water, or they'll wash their face in it. Mary asked that a church should be built there, and there are now, oh gosh, I don't know, maybe like four or five immense churches in the sanctuary of Lourdes. In Lourdes, the sick, the handicapped, are the first class citizens. They all they get the first, they get the best treatment. They go first, they go right to the front of the line. And there is a sense in which, well, this is what the church should be about, which is giving priority to the people who most need care. In her messages to Bernadette, Mary never said anything about miracles. But very quickly, the news spread that this young girl was receiving visions of the Virgin Mary who was speaking to her. People started turning up. The local authorities in Lourdes were kind of embarrassed about this, and they wanted to clamp down on it. They thought it was primitive and a little it's just part of something that they didn't want to, Lourdes to be known for. But pretty soon after the apparitions, there were news of miraculous healings there. So one of the things that Lourdes has become famous for is actually is miracles. No, I've never actually seen a miracle take place. The last officially recognized miracle happened in 1981. So it's a long time since then, since that happened. But I think in a way, going to those places which are, let's say, holy places, you do get touched by the holy in some ways. And there, are, I want to say that there are miracles which are perhaps daily miracles that perhaps you don't recognize as such. And something will change inside, even if it's just a recognition that actually, you know, you may complain a lot about things, but compared with some people, you're pretty well off. That in itself is a minor miracle. So one of the things that happens with Marian apparitions is that the place where Mary has been 
tends to turn into a holy place. One of the phenomena that happens with Marian apparitions are apparitions which are, let's say, semi-natural in some ways. Now, you might have heard about the eBay event when somebody had a piece of cheese which was supposed to look like Mary, and then it got sold off to somebody who lived in Vegas for a large amount of money. There's a recent one of a piece of chocolate melting, and when it when it melted, it froze again into its shape, which actually looked like Mary. In the subway system in Manila, a one of the pipes leaked on the floor and the stain looked, some people said, looked like Mary. And immediately it turned into a shrine. People brought candles there, they brought flowers, then people started praying there. So this is a kind of an instinct, I think, to have that Mary is somehow very close to people and it attracts people. Eventually what they had to do was to dig up the, 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 the paving and actually put it in a separate, separate chapel because people couldn't use the subway because of this. A similar thing happened when a, a kind of a shape, which looked a bit, I'll draw it for you with my finger, it kind of looks like that. And it's a stain or a mark which appeared on a window of an office building in Houston. Again, people said, this is Mary. Well, who's to say it isn't and who's to say it is? But I think there's a significant difference between those, what we could call perhaps semi-natural apparitions where the image of Mary appears or something which possibly looks like what we typically think of Mary looking. And one of the major apparition sites in this hemisphere, in the Americas, clearly the most important apparition and the apparition site is Guadalupe in Mexico. In the early 16th century, Mary appears to Juan Diego, who is um, a Nahua? He's a person, an indigenous person from the from the people who have been conquered by the by the Spaniards. The first written account of that comes about a hundred years later, and it is from that written account that we get the familiar details, which some people may know about how Mary appears to Juan Diego. She tells him to carry a message to the local bishop, bishop about building a church. The bishop doesn't believe him. This goes on three times, and then. He, the bishop asks for a sign. The sign is that he wants roses, and it's clearly it's the wrong season for roses, and he wants roses from Spain. Mary makes this happen. Juan Diego gathers them in his cloak and takes the cloak and lets the roses fall in front of the bishop, and then in, miraculously imprinted on the cloak is the image of our Lady of Guadalupe. And that is what people venerate today in the Basilica of Guadalupe, just outside Mexico City. Now, from that one event has become a whole, I want to say a world. I mean, Mexico, people will say, is actually born at that moment. So Mary, an Amarian apparition, becomes a symbol of a whole nation at that point. It's very difficult for people to understand the difference between Mexico and Guadalupe. When Mexico becomes independent, war of independence, they carry the flag of Guadalupe into battle. And so what I want to say here is that we get an idea here how important these things can be and precisely how passionate people feel about this. So their identity, who, how they think about themselves, is deeply, deeply woven in with their devotion towards Mary. The story of Fatima is one of a Marian apparition which has, let's say, grown with time. It goes back to the year 1917. It's the year which was the most bloody year of the First World War. In Portugal, at the time, there is a government which is really quite anti-religious. And Mary appears to three young children. Within two years, two of those children are dead. But it's the really, it's the, the one who doesn't die, Sister Lucia, who really pushes the thing along. I say Sister Lucia because she becomes a nun later on. She dies at the age of 95 in a convent in Portugal. Lucia told the story of the apparition several times. There are at least four written accounts of the apparitions. And each one of them gets a little more elaborate than the next one. Certainly, when Fatima happened, uh, the story got out very, very quickly because Mary is supposed to have given three secrets. 
And the third secret has always been the problematical one in Fatima. By the time of the last apparition, 70,000 people turned up in this place in Fatima, a little obscure rural village in Portugal, and saw what we refer to as the miracle of the sun dancing. It's a similar thing to what happened in Medjugorje. Now, can 70,000 people get the same religious experience? Is it possible to deceive 70,000 people? The first two secrets Lucia revealed, and one of them was the vision of hell. This is what Mary showed her and the two young friends. The second one was a promise of how it was possible to to get people out of hell and how to save the world, which is that the world had to be consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The third secret is what has always been a little bit problematical, because in one of her accounts, and she was already a nun at this point, Lucia says that really what was required was there was a prophecy, if you want, of communism, and that Russia would be converted back to Christianity if the world was co consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Jesus. But there is a content of the third secret, a part of the secret, which has never really been completely revealed. She wrote it down, and she sent the secret to the Vatican. There are all sorts of conspiracy theories about the content of the third secret of Fatima. One theory is that it foretells the assassination attempt on John Paul II. The Pope who read the actual secret that Lucy had written down is reputedly supposed to have fainted, reputedly supposed to have fainted when he read the content. Who, the man who is now a current Pope, who then was Cardinal Ratzinger and John Paul II, both knew the content of the secret. Cardinal Ratzinger, as he was then, said that everything which is in the third secret of Fatima is the same as you will find in the book of Revelation, which is the book of the Apocalypse. So it's to do, supposedly, with the um, end of time, possibility of dire punishment, and so forth. Nobody knows quite whether the, third, the secrets have been released or not whether it's something minor or whether it's something totally fantastical or not. What is distinctly true, however, is that Fatima has drawn millions and continues to draw millions of people to there. And it's a message, I'm going to say, of perhaps of conversion in some, some way. When people go to these places where visions have taken place, they quite often feel touched. Now, if people can go to those places, whether Mary appears to them or not, if they come away being more tolerant, more loving, more generous, more aware of the poor, more aware of injustice in the world and committing themselves to do something about that, that's a good thing. If they come away and they don't, and they continue to be selfish or they get more selfish, then clearly God is not behind that. So what I'm trying to say here is, Although these things are fascinating, I'm not entirely sure that they're that important. Because the revelation that happens in these places, the messages of Mary, if it is, or can only ever be the same message as the message of Jesus Christ. Self-sacrifice, transformation, resurrection. Anything which goes against that is not going to be from God. So we have to look at the after effects of these things. That's where it comes. It's not the first experience, but it's the effect that it leaves in the person afterwards. Um, I realized that that's well over 10 years ago since I made that video. And I think if I had the chance to go and do it again, I'd make one or make some corrections. And somebody pointed out that I confused Mexico City with Manila. Um, I also said something there, which I think is, I now would want to say with a lot more qualification, a bit more nuance and subtlety, which is, I said, I don't think these things are that important. I um, Well, I think probably what I should have said is that I don't think a Marian apparition or belief in it is essential to our Christian faith. But I do recognize the tremendous importance for people's devotion there, there to the uh, to the Blessed Mother. So uh, uh, let me kind of requalify that. 
Uh, now, for those of you who tuned in to listen to Professor Matadina, um, you may recognize that this is this is also a place of long and broken tradition. Um, Guadalupe started small. Uh, it was a local devotion that got very, very big. Um, but in many cases, I think I'll say again that many of them start off with a big bang and then over time they kind of fade away. So one of the questions really is really how do we interpret what was going on, this, this phenomenon which has lasted for 2,000 years? Well, the way that they have been interpreted ranges from mockery and skepticism to one hand to deep devotion and on the other hand. Uh, and the church has to be sort of find its way somewhere in the middle of that. And I think it really is there is a question about Mary and her connection with the church, because we must understand these phenomena. Uh, really, it's an important meeting place between, on the one hand, popular Catholic devotion, dogma and doctrine, and then the church authorities. And that relationship can sometimes be tense. So events such as Fatima and Lourdes have been prompted in port of papal statements. But generally, apparitions fall under a category which we call private devotions. Now, as I mentioned in the video, it's really hard to tell what's going on in, within somebody's soul or their mind. Um, um, but it is also true that there, uh, because of the link between psychology and spirituality, a private relation can be prone to deviation. So that's one reason why the Catholic Church has been very cautious about asserting, yes, this is definitely a place where the Blessed Mother has appeared. And of the thousands of claims, um, very few have been given formal approval. But even when the church has said, actually, there's nothing supernatural going on, devotees themselves may not be convinced. There is, for example, a small but very devoted group of followers um, of the visions or visions which were given in the 1940s and 50s to Sister Mildred Mary Nuzel in Ohio, who reported many visions of the Blessed Mother and a series of messages, including that she wished to be known as Our Lady of America. So the events were investigated by the Bishop of Fort Wayne, South Bend, and he said this, the visions and revelations cannot be said to be of supernatural origin in the case that they are objective, occur uh, objective occurrences. So I cannot approve or support public devotion or cult. But devotion continues, and it's still, at, I guess, at a private level, and Sister Mildred's supporters continue to hope for approval. It has been always, and it continues to be, the local bishop who does the discernment about the truth or not of apparitions, and sometimes the Vatican, too, gets involved. And how do they decide whether something is actually worthy of belief or not? There are four main criteria. Number one. How do the visionaries behave after the events? What is their character like? Two, is the message orthodox and uh, is it accurate? And then uh, another one would be, is there any other explanation for the event, such as manipulation or deceit? Yeah. And then finally, what is the fruit of the apparition amongst people? Do we see, for example, in conversion or improved morals, or do we see cases of healing? So those are criteria, and then the, the uh, church authorities make a judgment, and there are roughly three alternatives. One, the apparitions can be said to have a divine supernatural origin, and in this case, Catholics may believe in the apparition, but they don't have to. That's the thing. Two, the case is unproven, but it is not rejected. You know, this, this church may provide pastoral guidance at shrines, but also some cautious encouragement. So right now, I mentioned maybe Gorgia in the video, and that's where we are with this. It's unproven, but not rejected. And then three, an apparition would be another judgment that would be an apparition is not divine in origin, and therefore... Catholics should shun devotion to this. Uh, you may remember that there were apparitions in Garabandal in Spain in the 1960s. Those have been uh, dismissed as actually not being, they're just not true. Now, I'm a theologian, and um, theologians vary in our opinions about apparitions. Some people claim that this is just subjective. It's just internal to the person. 
others, the experts say, no, you have to understand them in their time and place. Um, they do have undoubted value, but their role in the church and in the lives of Christians has boundaries. And the best situation is where an apparition and a devotion is taken up into the sacraments and the liturgy and the life of the church. And I'd say that Guadalupe and Lourdes are both wonderful examples of that. So they are visions of the church and they are visions for the church. And at their heart is the encounter with God. Now, the then Cardinal Ratzinger wrote, the criterion for the truth and the value of a private revelation is its orientation to Christ. Does it lead us to Jesus? Now, that's very particularly important where an apparition such as Guadalupe or to, or to a particular miraculous image like uh, Nuestra Señora de la Caridad, that's particularly important when it resonates, those images, those, um, those devotions resonate with the spirit of the people. Yeah. Um, the popularly religious instinct of popular devotion. Does this lead us to Jesus or not? What I would say is that each apparition is its own way a message to a particular time and a particular place. Naturally, it's logically, it's going to be affected by the, who the visionaries are, their level of education, their background, and so forth. And it's going to have a, the, it's going to be a characteristics which are affected by the place in which they live. Any explanation of an apparition which is too simple, I think, runs a risk. And that is the risk of, un of underestimating that something, a phenomenon like an apparition of a Blessed Mother or a miraculous, uh, miraculous image can have many, many different levels of meaning. Sometimes conflicting meanings or ideas, intentions, such as, for example, between the church and the visionaries. But I want to say that these messages go deep into the heart of the faithful. And for that reason, I'm now disagreeing with myself and saying, yes, I think these things are important. Um, in conclusion, um, I am going to say one thing, and it is my conviction that image, uh, Im miraculous images and apparitions of the Blessed Mother are not going to go away. God has spoken his final word to us in Jesus, and the mission of his mother is always to show us the way to her son, and through him, our way to the Father. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Father Dorian, so much for this phenomenal presentation. I actually have two, two questions that are like my own. Um, so I'm curious to know how you integrate, because you're a Mariologist. So like, how do you integrate this into your own spirituality? Like, do you pray to Mary often? Do you visit different shrines around the world? Like, like how is this integrated into your day-to-day -day life? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> so, the, um, you know, it's a very thing. Mary says very, very little in the scriptures. You know, uh, and her final word, and she's mostly a woman wrapped in silence, I think, as they said. And the last, the last thing we find the Blessed Mother saying is, do whatever he tells you. So in my life, I would say that I feel very strongly, you know, the presence of the Blessed Mother. Um, um, and I do, you know, when I do visit shrines, yes, that's actually part of my uh, devotion. I mean, this began... You know, I would say as a young, young man, I did not have, I was not a sort of, I mean, I had a Marian, didn't have much Marian devotion. I think as time has gone on, I've come to understand far, far more deeply. So I would say the presence of Mary is, uh, she's there in my faith life, absolutely, um, quietly, but constantly. Yeah. yeah, I think the word fiat, um, I have a sweater that says fiat on my it's, on it it's a great <laughs> word to live your life by right it's yeah. just that that yes to the lord and whatever he's asking us to do in the Absolutely. moment and it's so um, hard you know and that's why you know the immaculate conception which we just celebrated this month is so important because mary is free to be able to give a 100 percent yes whereas most of us struggle with us so that you know if we get to 40 percent, we're doing well yeah and isn't that so ignatian too you know like they're just having that holy indifference the ignatian indifference and like to, to have that freedom to say yes. It is about freedom. And yeah. That's what, the, yeah. That's what her, her freedom for original sin is about. She's totally free. 
Yeah. Right, right. So the other question I have is for folks who might be listening or who will listen to this later, um, and it, perhaps for some reason they don't have a Marian devotion. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice on how how they can grow in Marian devotion? Because, you know, St. Yeah. Ignatius has that saying, like, pray for what you desire. <laughs> um, and so like thinking about that, like what like what can folks do practically to kind of grow in that devotion? Oh, that's a, that's a really, really great question. You know, um, I would say talk to Mary, you know, talk to Mary, so read the scriptures, first of all, and see where she appears, but also um, talk to Mary, and understand that, you know, it will come in time, um, and that even if we don't have a Marian devotion, she has a devotion to us, <laughs> you know, so that, they, and as I say, it's kind of silent, and she's in the background as well, I, I was talking the other day to some high school kids, and talking about, and saying that I think of Mary, it's like your mom who checks it, you know, um, will just check in on you every so often, and even though you don't want her to, you know, better thing. And I, I think in a way the app, Marian apparitions are they, that's where Mary checking in on this world. Yeah. That's, that's powerful. I like that a lot. Um, as you were talking on the video and even now, it just comes, I, I mean, I think of so many things. I think of the Magnificat and like, I, I have prayed with the Magnificat so much. I remember being, so I went to school also with the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, but I would go, um, pray with the Dominicans at, at their priory. And they have this beautiful chapel um, where we would like sing back and forth to one another. And we sang the Magnificat like back and forth. It was just so stunning. And I think from that moment in grad school to now, like the Magnificat has so, something that spoke to me as well as it's crazy. I started listing. I'm like, I've been to Lourdes. I've been, this summer we went to Montserrat. Grad school, I went to Our Lady of Guadalupe and I've been to the chapel in Miami. I'm like, I've been following her everywhere. And I, I it wasn't yeah. like intentional. It may, it, it may be mutual, uh, Rosie, you know, <laughs> yeah. she may be following you everywhere. Yeah. You know? That's a good point. That's, that's, a, that's a beautiful story. You know, it's, um, you know, it was St. Bernard of Clairvaux in the, in the um, 11th century says, you know, you can, De Maria non consatis, which really means you can't ever praise Mary enough. And, you know, um, in a way, I think it's just a question of just letting this sink in and letting yourself marinate in it you know and allowing that allowing you know your faith to want to, um, to to work at its own pace that's i think that's it uh, that's it that's the thing you know and mary's the great model of faith as you said the fiat you know i mean she is the woman of faith but and she's a model but she also is a mother who's there to intercede for us as well yeah Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much. I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity to listen to you and to learn from you. Yeah, I should um, say, may I just say one thing that, that? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. That if you wanted to see that video again, um, it's actually up on vi uh, Vimeo and on YouTube. Um, and the uh, it's you can Google Jesuits on Marian apparitions, and that will pop up as well. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thanks again. I'm really grateful for your time. And for anybody who tuned in, thank you so much for tuning in. If you like more content like this throughout the year, please consider becoming a member of the Catholic Association for Latino Leadership. For more information on this, please email administration at call-usa.org. We hope that you have a blessed Advent and a wonderful Christmas season. Thank you so much. God bless.